buddies, J-Rock right here. Today I'm going to be dropping another comic review. We're going to be reviewing something that was a little bit controversial at the time that it came out. This is Thor God of Goddess of Thunder. This is the first uh, trade is being the first five issues. It's written by Jason Aaron and the artist. The artist is Russell Ditterman. I believe that's how you say it. Now, now this was controversial at the time because it was kind of a uh, passing of the mantle. So whenever you do that in comics, there's going to be people that are against it, of course, that are like, oh, what's happening to my character? You're taking them away and you're giving the cape or the cow, as you say, to another character. Like, oh, what's up with that? Some people don't like that. Once you've been reading a while, you'll realize that this happens every few years, every four or five years or so. Um... They pass the mantle onto a different character just to keep things from getting stale. The reason they do that is because sometimes people can get bored with the character, be like, ah, it's kind of kind of boring already. So you give the mantle to another character, and then when you, the OG comes back, you realize how much you miss him. You're like, oh man, I'm so happy he's back. And you realize how cool he is again. Kind of like you're introducing him all over. So you know, it's like uh, sometimes you gotta take something away to realize how much you actually like it. Because then we get spoiled with this stuff. It's, my shit's so good, you ain't even impressed no more. You're used to it. So this is this is kind of one of those situations here. But what ended up happening is a lot of people said the sales even went up on this book. Because when a new character carries a Thor mantle, I heard the stories got even better. And, and this person was a lot more interesting than Thor was. So uh, than Odin's son. So I'm hyped to read this. I, I'm also a big uh, Jason Aaron fan. So I've never read something from him I didn't like. So um, uh, my expectations are, are pretty high for this one. So let's get into it. Okay, so this story starts off where Odin's son, he's at the moon and he's depressed on the moon because he can't lift his hammer anymore. He's no longer worthy. So, so he's depressed about it. I guess some breaking news happened in the previous issues that it's not revealed here and he's no longer worthy so his parents his mom and dad are trying to console him and well his dad is telling him you know get off your ass stop being a whiny bitch get over it and the mom is trying to console him and the dad's arguing with her like you know stop coddling them that's not the way we do things in asgard because you know they're vikings they're men's men uh that shit don't go so argument there then we cut to a scene where the Frost Giants are invading this, like, uh, submarine of these uh, miners that are under ocean, finding this, they found something. At this point, we don't know yet, but later on, we'll find out it's a skull of a dead king uh, from the Frost Giants. So they're after what they found. They're like, you found the skull, we want it. Then we cut to another part where someone's lifting the hammer. And they're saying there has to always be a Thor. So they lift the hammer. They're now Thor. And we don't know why this person's even worthy. Why were they allowed to carry the hammer? What makes them so special? So that's kind of weird. It was a question we're always asking uh, through the book. And I think, if you know, it's comics. So I think the point of it was just get over. There is no reason why this person's worthy. They're just a regular person. So there's really no explanation. It's just like, just go with it, you know, just go with it so we could get the story going. Now, when this um, new Thor arrives, it's a woman. So she's the new Thor. And when she picks up the hammer, all of a sudden, like, she doesn't just get Thor's powers. But all of a sudden, she knows, she starts talking like him. And she knows where the villains are at and how to show up at the right place at the right time to stop evil doers and so forth i don't know if that's all because of the hammer or if she was just written that way i think every writer i don't read Thor. this the first story i've read so i don't know if um that's a thing with the hammer that's consistent or every writer just gives them different types of power some make it just the fighting skills some give them the knowledge and memories or or how all that works with the hammer but here once she picks it up she knows everything thor knows basically so I, uh, I'm going to go with that. That's just what the hammer does. We're going to go with that. She shows up everywhere. She knows how to fight. She knows how to talk like him. 
And uh, at the same time, she's kind of explaining to you that supposedly she's barely learning, but yet doesn't seem like she's barely learning. She's just great at everything right from the get-go. Uh, it would have been kind of fun to see her make mistakes and kind of lose some fights and, and like, uh, next time come back and come back stronger and improve upon it. Upon, like, you know, show, showing her learning as she goes, you kind of don't get that. Like, right from the beginning, she's already just as good as Thor was, if not maybe even better. Because once he bumps into her, he says, oh, I could never use the hammer like that. Like, you're 10 times better than me. Uh, he, I'm paraphrasing here. He didn't exactly say it that way, but it was implied. So that was a little iffy. And uh, also, while all this was happening, we showed how Thor is nothing without his hammer. He quickly gets destroyed by this dark elf, and he chops off his hand and sends him on his way to hell to the deep oceans of the sea, right? So I was like, wow, Thor's really, this being my first Thor, but like, he's really, he ain't shit without the hammer. It's really the hammer that does all the work. One thing I really like is that Jason Aaron is self-aware. He knows what the fans are saying, what the fans are crit critiquing or what they're complaining about and so forth. But he's not one of these writers like uh, your Gail Simone or your Mark Wade, where they let this stuff get to them and they go complaining on Twitter and they get in Twitter wars with the fans where they complain anytime a fan doesn't agree with something of their that's happening in their stories, right? They immediately as a fan's fall for not liking it. Well, you as the writer, it's it's your job to make sure they like it, right? You give the consumer something he wants to buy. And Jason Aaron doesn't do that. He lets his art speak for him, which I really respect him for that. Here, he constantly points out, like, he has Thor point out, oh, you're stealing my words, and you're stealing my name. Like, just because you have that hammer doesn't mean you got to talk like me and be called Thor. So he's self-aware. He's using the Thor character to speak for the fans, basically. And he's so angry at her, he's trying to beat her up. You know, he's basically portraying the fans through, the, through Odin's son. So the new lady Thor is fighting them, and they're fighting. And I thought that was cool. I go, yeah, he lets the and the the art speak for itself. It's like, you look, this is what I know the fans are saying, and so forth. That was real fun. I enjoyed that. And then there's a scene where she's fighting Absorbing Man, and he's saying, oh, now, now you're probably going to start with your feminist politics and the stories and so forth, because you're a lady Thor. So he's saying that, and he goes, the real Thor is a man, and he's not just any man. He's like one of the manliest mans we still got left in this world. So when a oh, sorry man saying all that, it's like you could tell he's, he's he's doing that for the fans. Like, look, I know this is how you guys feel, and I know that you're upset it's a woman, and so forth. So then he cuts to another panel later, towards the end of the story, where she says, uh, and this is, he's speaking now through the new Thor character. He goes, I know I'm the new Thor, but don't worry, give me time, I'll... I'll do the Thor name proud. I won't, I won't uh, disrespect the Thor character, basically. He's saying it to, to the fans through the character, which I thought was genius. I like that. That's just a throwback to the old school. Before Twitter and all this, social media stuff, that's how artists and that's how writers portray their feelings was in the next issue. You know, that, and he's having the fans speak through the old Thor and he's speaking through the new Thor. Like reasoning with them, I thought that was real cool. Uh, I miss when when comics used to do that it was fun, and they should do that more often instead of venting on Twitter and getting in these arguments with people. That left on a real high note for me. I I thought it was a kind of average story, honestly. It was eh, but then towards the end, once I started started doing some of this in there. It left on a real high note, in my opinion. I think the art carried, like, this what kept you entertained, because there wasn't a lot of story to it, really. A lot of it was just fight scenes, which, when it comes to fight scenes, I think it's very important, the artist you have, more than the writer. So most of it was fight scenes, and in the fight scenes, nothing important uh, being said. They're just like, oh, F you, or, or cracking jokes toward, at each other's expenses. That's all they're saying in the dialogue while they're fighting, and since most of the book was that, was in a lot of story through Odin Sun or through um, the new Thor. Now, the when the Dark Elf is speaking on his scenes, that's when you need to read because he's the one that's moving the story along. All his dialogue, all his scenes are important. The Thor scenes, uh, you can look at the art, look at the cool fight scenes, and not have to read 
read those pages because nothing important is being said. And also this Dark Elf was probably my favorite character in the whole story. He comes off as smart, deceiving, and villainous. And he comes off as like one of those persons that he'll team up with you if it's in his best interest. You know, so he can side with the good guys if it's... So he was a cool character. I really dig him. And I kind of wish the story was more about the Dark Elves than about the Frost Giants. The Frost Giants don't really interest me. They come off as just big, strong, like, meatheads, like, don't have a lot to say, are not very bright, they're just all muscle, right? It's kind of like a, just your generic henchman, basically. Did this live up to the hype? In my opinion, the way it was hyped up, a lot of people said it was a great read. I would say no. I think it was a nice read, but it wasn't a great read. It wasn't, um, I think it's one of those books that you had to read it as it was coming out. And the excitement was trying to figure out who the store is. I think that's what made it fun. It is a fun read. It's, it's fun. It's entertaining. I probably will read the volume too, just to finish seeing what happens. But story-wise, I felt it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of depth to the story. It was pretty linear, straightforward, kind of comedic. It was entertaining. Uh, but it was good enough to make me want to pick up the second volume and, and continue the story, see where it goes. Okay, guys, if you like what you saw here, uh, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. That way, I'll keep you updated on more future uh, comic reviews. And other than that, I'd like to just thank you guys for taking some time out of your day to check this video out. And I'll check you guys out next time.